Welcome to Travels Through Time, the podcast made in partnership with Colourgraph. I'm Artemis Ervin, and in today's episode, we're travelling back to a turning point in the Second World War, not only for France, but for one of France's most important and daring spies, Mathilde Carré. In May 1940, the German army stormed into France and threw the country into a dark and tumultuous four years of violence, deprivation and moral ambiguity. Indeed, this period is often brought up as a kind of moral thought experiment. What would you have done? Would you have joined the resistance or kept your head down? But for French citizens like Mathilde Carré, this question was not hypothetical, but terrifyingly and startlingly real. For her, at first, the decision was obvious. She became determined to, as she wrote, at all costs, die as a martyr for France. So she became a spy and helped found the most important intelligence network in the country. Mathilde is the enigmatic heroine at the centre of Victoire, a wartime story of resistance, collaboration and betrayal, a new book by today's guest, Roland Phillips. Roland was a leading publisher for many years and his book has been described by Carmen Khalil as wonderful, atmospheric and a miraculous portrait of a flawed human being. I spoke to Roland about Mathilde and the year 1940 just last week. Thank you so much for joining us today on Travels Through Time, Roland. It's a real pleasure to have you. Thank you for asking me. So before we get started into our time travelling, I wanted to talk to you a bit about your book, Victoire. When did you first come across um, Mathilde's story and what made you want to write it? I first came across uh, Mathilde Carey's story about four years ago. I was very interested in telling a wartime story, first of all, from a woman's point of view, Uh, because I think there are a lot of men. But also, I wanted to... So much writing about Second World War is British victors, German uh, uh, losers. Um, And I got very interested in what it would be like to be in an occupied country, in France, and what you would have to do to survive, and whether how far your patriotism... uh, could take you, but in certain certain senses, how you would survive. Um, so I was reading around about, in particular, double agents, and I was in the National Archives in Kew reading about Mathilde's partner in the network they founded, who was a Pole called Roman Chinyaski, uh, who became a, a, a famous double agent. He was part of the Operation Fortitude deception, which which guided the Germans towards Calais as the the point of the D-Day landings rather than Normandy. And in his file, I came across this extraordinary sort of critique he did of some manuscript, and I didn't know what the manuscript was, where he was saying, after he'd arrived in England in 1943, he was saying, yes, this happened, that didn't happen, Um, she hasn't given me enough credit for this. And I thought, what is this strange manuscript and then it turned out to be written by Mathilde Carré when she arrived in London in 1942 and I followed it up from there. And like you say it's this period of history it's kind of so fraught with moral ambiguity and it's like a bit of a cliche that everyone says if you had been in occupied France during the war would you have been part of the resistance or would you have just kept your head down and everyone loves to think that they would be part of the resistance but obviously it's certainly not that simple. And I was just wondering how you navigated that moral ambiguity as the author and how did you avoid um, looking back with the benefit of historical hindsight and thinking, well, that was clearly a a terrible thing to do and and they've betrayed, you know, X, Y and Z. I don't want to give away too many spoilers, Mm. but yeah, how did you navigate that? Well, I think what I tried to do was to hold uh, the people in my mind as actual people uh, rather than simply French people betraying or whatever it may be and I came across a number of people who when betrayed were offered either uh, death or some form of collaboration and many of them 
quite simply said I had to collaborate because I was the only person putting food on my family's table. And if I'd been killed, then what would have happened? So I, I tried to take each story on its own merits and think, really think, what would I do in those circumstances? And of course, um, there were some uh, moral disasters and some would say some of Mathilde's choices were morally disastrous but is that better than being killed and uh, is it better to keep hope alive that at least as she did that at least you could get back on the right side or is it better to to doom possibly your whole family or one of the cases that struck me most was Louis Renault of the car factory who was really offered the choice of either all his workers being sacked and the Germans would take over the factory to make lorries for the for their war effort, and he would possibly he'd be taken to Germany as a prisoner of war, or they could make lorries for the war effort, and his workers would be kept on side. And to me, that's a fairly clear choice. But he was arrested after the war for collaboration. So it's 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 so much greyer than hindsight allows us which I, I think is why still in parts of France the, the war is not spoken of because because of these uh, moral grey areas. And maybe it would be good um, to just introduce us a bit to Mathilde before we launch into uh, the your chosen year. So who was she and what had her life been like running up to the outbreak of the Second World War? She was born in in 19... 19- 13 um, and uh, she'd been a rather neglected child uh, she lived with her grandparents in the in the Haute Jura in the, in in the mountains in the south never really known her parents and she had a sort of terrific yearning to be loved and to be important and this sort of strange strain which was very unfulfilled um, she got married at the age of 20, married a school teacher, went to be a, a school teacher in uh, in French Algeria. The war came along and they separated. Uh, and she, at the beginning of the war, thought, now I can be useful. And she became a nurse and nursed throughout the fall of France, which, which she saw some terrible sights, which we'll come on to. Um, and uh, she was one of uh, only a handful of her nursing intake who, who fought throughout the war, uh, who nursed throughout the fall of France. Uh, she took as a lover a man she was nursing and became pregnant and at last felt fulfilled. But shortly afterwards, she miscarried France fell, she miscarried, her lover went back off to the war in Syria and she thought her life was over. She had no more use, she tried um, and she was about to commit suicide when she suddenly thought, no, I will, if I'm going to die, I'll commit a useful death in the service of my country. I'll become a second Joan of Arc. So this sort of, uh, her esteem soared up again. So I think that leads us really nicely into the year that it all happens. So if you could travel back in time, what year would you like to visit? I'd like to visit 1940, um, when the when France was invaded. It seems to me a year of such extraordinary emotion and reversal. Uh, France would would was never expected to collapse as quickly as it did in a matter of weeks. At the same time, it's the birth of resistance and this extraordinary French spirit asserting itself and also the unheard of, uh, unprecedented situation France found itself in, which was split in half, which is the sort of impetus behind my whole book. So the north of France is occupied, south of France has its own government, the Vichy government, um, and this and that all this happened in a matter of weeks, and it's an extraordinary time. So let's uh, let's get into it. Let's go to your first scene that you would like to visit. Um, what is the first scene you'd like to visit in 1940? The first scene I'd like to visit is June 1940. Uh, to be specific, the 17th of June. Um, France is collapsing, as I say, completely unexpectedly. The, the Wehrmacht, the German army machine, is absolutely crushing them. Mathilde herself has been nursing in the north of France, has seen appalling injuries, uh, has retreated twice her nursing station, and now she is caught up in what became known as the Exodus, um, where 
really the whole of northern France, I mean, huge numbers of people, six to eight million citizens were heading from the north, from Paris and the Seine region, uh, going between three and 12 miles per day through a country there was less and less food, the residents were furious. Uh, and for example, of the 23,000 residents of Chartres in May, only 800 were there a month later. So these millions and millions of people heading south, they believed there was going to be a last uh, military stand uh, on the Loire, and they were being pressed south by the German army. So this extraordinary columns of people, some had cars when they ran out of petrol, they just left them, old people being in, carried in carts, they piled on all they could kitchen equipment onto their wheelbarrows. And meantime, the German Stukas, who made these this terrible screaming noise as they dive-bombed, were shooting up these columns of people. Uh, they were just, as they people were killed and horses were killed, they were just shoved to the side of the road, appalling stench. And it made the whole humiliation of the defeat sort of so much worse. I mean, the Exodus, it, it's a sort of biblical scene, um, given a biblical name. It sounds absolutely terrifying, mm. doesn't it? I really, yeah, I can't even imagine what it must have been like. And Mathilde is amongst amongst this mass exodus of people? She is. She's with her one nursing colleague, her, her great friend, and um, she is is heading south. Uh, she is creeping along. She uh, falls in with a with a, a group of soldiers who who put her on her their lorry. Um, they're carrying this wounded man who becomes her lover and the father of her baby who who she miscarries, and uh, they end up in a in a monastery in the south. And they all sleep in the cells and she, in fact, becomes pregnant under an enormous statue of the Virgin Mary, she later says. And then the next day, they, they have no more petrol for their lorry, so they have to stay there. So she, she starts and it's the end of her war. The armistice is, in fact, signed a few days later and it's the, it's the last ditch of her, her nursing life. And what would the armistice involve when it was signed? So the armistice was a very hotly debated um, thing, still hotly debated. Basically, it set up to preserve the French Republic. Um, so the Germans said they would occupy the north, but the French government could continue to run the south, and it set itself up in Vichy. Uh, there were reparations to be paid, financial reparations, certain amount of agricultural product and industrial products had to be sent to Germany. The French were allowed to keep 100,000 men under arms, which was the same number the Germans were allowed to keep after the First World War. And it was what divided France into two. My view is that at the time, the Vichy government was not didn't become the collaborationist government it became later and it, it did its best to preserve the, the French state. But it, it drew a line across the middle of France which led to all their later troubles but there's no question that it preserved French life and the French Republic for the time being because the Germans had no interest in running a country the size of France. They wanted to get on and invade Britain and, and really end the war. So it, it suited them because it, it meant France continued to look after itself. And obviously no, uh, no citizen is happy or comfortable with the idea of their country being invaded. But I did notice in my research and also in your, in your book that there was an attitude amongst some French people that they not didn't mind, but I think the phrase is better Hitler than Bloom. Yes, Absolutely. He was the, the Prime Minister at the time. Absolutely. And you have to remember that at that time, uh, the bigger enemy was communism. I mean, they'd rather be uh, run by fascists than communists. I mean, they, they'd seen, obviously, what had happened in Soviet Russia and the appalling abuses uh, then and, and genocides. Um, and throughout the war, that this was the sort of, great debate and, and in particular when 
came to trials after the war. Many people thought communism was a worse enemy than Hitler. So, yeah, absolutely. And what is Mathilde's uh, state at the moment? You mentioned that she has felt she's led a she's led an unfulfilling life leading up to the um, outbreak of the war and she does find purpose in nursing but yeah what well, could you just take us through you know where where how you think she's feeling at this point well she's had as i say as you say she's had an unfulfilling life the war is is her great moment and she feels she can be of use at last and now all that has collapsed plus her hope of having a child she's left her husband she's only to see him once more she's decided she'd never want to see him again she's in a state of pretty much total despair and the armistice itself is a is a terrible blow she sees it as a abject act of cowardice on behalf of her uh, government and this is the the end and it is this moment from here on uh in fact she hasn't lost the baby at this point of course um but uh may not even know she's pregnant but from here on the sort of spiral down begins that um ends so dramatically in in Toulouse in September I remember years ago reading some accounts of what it was like to live in London during the war and some people were describing that it was almost quite romantic. It could feel quite romantic that everything was heightened. You know, you might see um, you might see your lover one night and not know if you ever see them again when you say goodbye. Everything becomes obviously terrifying. Uh, it requires you know you you witness total acts of horror and violence, but also there's this like incredible kind of rush, an adrenaline rush. And I definitely got the sense that that's something that Mathilde starts to experience as she establishes what her purpose for the rest of the war might be. Absolutely. And indeed, she she reported, uh, when being on the Exodus, she reported almost being, well, being excited by the danger um, when the Germans were attacking these columns. Uh, she was quite stimulated by that. I think she felt alive for the first time in her life. And she, she definitely um, responded to that. And I think... Just before we move on to the um, to the next scene you want to visit, which is this moment of huge emotional kind of crisis, and uh, you've sort of outlined it briefly in the introduction, I just wanted to talk a bit about why had this happened to France? Why did France fall so quickly? What was going on? What was going on there? Well, um, militarily, they were simply unprepared for the new type of German attack. I suppose, in a sense, they were they were fighting the last war again. Um, they were expecting a sort of dug-in trench war, which they they would win. Uh, if France did delay too long. Uh, if they'd taken the fight to Germany a few months earlier, uh, and the war had been going on for nearly nine months by the time the Germans invaded, then they would have crushed Germany because the German army was busy in the east of the country. Um, so that's true to say. They built these great forts, uh, the Maginot Line. The German military machine was very much panzer-based, fast uh, armoured vehicles who simply went around the forts and uh, fortifications, static fortifications, uh, as as used in the First World War. And they simply weren't prepared for the new Blitzkrieg type of warfare, uh, as the Germans just punched a hole in the Maginot Line and came storming on. So moving on to our next scene, uh, we've arrived in the south. Would you like to tell us where we are? We're in Toulouse, which is in the southwest of France, in the uh, non-occupied zone, Zonunu, as as it was known, uh, non u I I mean. So that's Vichy, France. And at that point, you really wouldn't know France had been conquered. There's plenty of food. There were no curfews in the south. Uh, life went on pretty much as normal. Toulouse, was, as a big city, was a great uh, meeting point for refugees from the north including Mathilde. It was easy to get into neutral Spain from there and, and, and so on. Uh, so there is Mathilde. She's lost her husband. She's lost her baby. She's lost her lover. Uh, she's lost her purpose, uh, which was nursing and, and fighting for France. And she 
decides her life is over and she's standing on her uh, bridge over the Garonne, the huge river that runs through Toulouse, when suddenly she has a sort of revelation uh, that she's going to become a second Joan of Arc, as she puts it, and commit a useful suicide in the service of France. And she is prone to these great mood swings uh, throughout her life of going from elation and importance to suicidal depression. But this is a, a moment when she decides the war isn't over for her. She'll, she doesn't know what her role will be, um, but she's going to be of use. Uh, so she comes down off the bridge and three nights later, in mid-September, in mid -September, uh, goes to a restaurant in Toulouse called La Frégate, which is still there, with a girlfriend. And across the room, her eye meets this uh, rather remarkable, very small, green-eyed, energetic man with terrible teeth, as she says, who catches her eye and outside the restaurant he approaches her and he gives a false name. Uh, he pretends he, he's French and brought up in Romania, hence his terrible accent, and says, could she come to his hotel the following day and teach him French? And I don't think that was his only motive to learn better French either, uh, which she does. And this is her first meeting with Roman Chinyowski, who, after a couple of weeks, tells her his his revolutionary vision for an intelligence network made up of dozens of, of separate cells with each agent only reporting to one age, um, other agent so they never know who's at the top and, and that this will be the key network, uh, intelligence network in the occupied zone. And in fact, it's the only network because when... The fall of France was so fast that we, the British, had no time to put any uh, spies in. And once the network is up and running, which we'll come on to, our spies say this is our only source of intelligence from occupied France. So this chance meeting in a restaurant in Toulouse leads to this huge and vital uh, intelligence network. Mm, kind of one of those amazing chance meetings in history which are so irresistible mm. uh, irresistible to kind of revisit and to talk about what if ha what if that hadn't have happened what if she'd gone to a different restaurant before we speak about Roman because he's as you describe a fascinating character and I feel like we need to talk about him kind of uh, give uh, some specific attention to him I just wanted to talk about like you say this um, this moment of emotional crux for Mathilde because it kind of was making me think when I was reading the book about is there you know to become a spy or to 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 start the line of work that she starts does it require a certain emotional temperament you know you need to have had a certain background I mean it sounds so silly but people talk about the kind of James Bond stereotype of a spy that they have no family nothing to kind of live for that he's just this like single-minded um, spy that's what makes him uh, 007 and I kind of was wondering if that's a bit what's going on with her that you need these people who um, it's not just patriotism but it's this feeling of like I have nothing else to live for so I'll do this. That's such a, a, a good question. I think you're right to a point. I think because she had no emotional ties, because she didn't uh, feel that close to her parents or her brother, who was much younger, uh, she, um, her husband had, had gone off. He was fighting in Syria and she now despised him anyway. Uh, she had no lover. So in part, this need for emotional fulfilment was filled by the chance of being a spy and, and serving her country. And I think in that way, it was not just patriotism, but it was a deep emotional need to be needed. I also think what we what she didn't know, and I don't think, I think was a surprise to her, was how incredibly well organised she was and how extraordinarily brave. And I think that's the, the other key. I mean, she was brave to the point of foolhardiness later in, 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 uh, in Andrew Allier's time. Um, during the war, obviously, there were lots of female spies. And I just wanted to kind of talk about the particular nature of being a woman and a spy were there particular dangers were there particular 
attitudes. With I you. think being a woman was an advantage to her um, in that I think she wasn't suspected when the network was up and running and she was um, scurrying around Paris doing her work. Uh, I think she would was under the radar as a woman. There weren't, I mean, there'd been Marta Hari in the First World War, but there weren't, women weren't thought of by the Germans as likely to be spies. And I think the German mindset was very much of armed resistance rather than espionage. I think that she had terrific empathy for her agents. In fact, a number of the, the, the certainly the Paris-based staff of Andre Allier, um, were women, partly because the men were were otherwise were either prisoners of war or otherwise occupied. Um, but I think, and it gave her a balance with Chinerski, who was a very male man, if that makes sense, um, and relied on her to do all the the sort of housekeeping. I mean, she did the accounts. She looked after the heads of the of each sector in a uh, practical way and later on um in the story i hope it's not it's not too much of a spoiler but she does start an affair with the german officer who arrests her and that's a really that's a really like complex moment in the book and you talk about the moral ambiguity of it i mean she's essentially coerced into mm. having an affair with this person because it's basically like either either i execute you or we work together um yeah. And you say that she, when when thinking back on this moment in her life later on, she says, "What else could I have done?" Which is mm. something that so many French, a position that so many French women found themselves in, and that struck me as a a particularity about being a woman at this time. Absolutely, and and that uh, element of the of of the French experience is a sort of shocking thing post war the the degradation, degrading punishment that women went through in the sort of kangaroo courts. They would have their head shaves, be paraded naked, all that sort of thing. And indeed, Victoire's own treatment in court after the war, even though she'd been heroic in so many other ways before and after this period with the German captor of, of two months, this was what the court kept coming back to. And this was the most shocking thing about her case was she slept with the German. She slept with the enemy, whereas it's reckoned of the prisoners of war in in Germany, French prisoners of war in Germany, it's reckoned there are around 80,000 babies born to French men and German women in the war, but none of those men were criticised for a moment for having affairs with 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 the enemy um so i think it's a, it's a dark and contemporary to, to i mean contemporary moment too um it's a very dark question mark over france the the treatment of women who who slept with men and as you say i mean uh hugo bleicher her captor came to her room <coughs> and undressed and and slept with her on the day the day after he'd arrested her, her first day out of prison. And she describes how complete, you know, she was understandably in shock. And what else could she do? Mm. So um, turning now to Roman, the man who you describe as her salvation when she meets him in that restaurant, um, what kind of person was he? And why was he uh, so energised about this um, this network, espionage network, that he'd come up with the idea for? What, what made him, what motivated him? What motivated him was patriotism for Poland. He'd been a uh, an airman. He'd had a crash uh, in the Polish Air Force uh, and been put into the Polish espionage service pre-war. Then he joined up the Polish army in France, Polish regiment, and um, was also a a casualty of the war uh, who was in Toulouse. What he had was total belief that espionage was the fourth way, so air, sea, land and spying. And in the end, spying was going to be the vital thing. So he had total belief in espionage and then came up with this, he had an epiphany really, where he saw this idea of the interlocking sectors 
uh, all reporting to one person, him, and as being a radical new way of 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 being a, of of running a network, having a network, and um, so he was immensely energetic, total belief in espionage, and he had this brilliant idea. And he was a refugee from Poland, almost. He's... He was a refugee from Poland. So at the beginning of the war, uh, he'd been in a Polish uh, regiment fighting for for France or for the Allies. And when France fell, that regiment was disbanded and he remained in France uh, where he had this this idea. Hello. At Travels Through Time, we're incredibly proud to be partnering with Jordan Lloyd and Colograph. Jordan is one of the world's leading visual historians. Through his excellent craftsmanship, he brings black and white photographs of the past to life in startling colour and clarity. Jordan's extraordinary work, as well as that of his contemporaries, can be found on the website colorgraph.co. At colorgraph.co, you'll be able to explore the process and history behind the colorization work, but most excitingly of all, you can also buy some of these beautiful photographs as museum-grade fine art prints. They make an unusual and striking present for that friend or family member of yours who loves the past, and they're an excellent addition to any room. Whether it's a colorized photograph of the US Capitol building from 1846, or a candid shot of the Beatles from 1964, you're pretty sure to find something that enchants you. I know I certainly have many times. It's hard to explain really over audio just how cool these prints are, so I encourage you to have a look for yourself at colorgraph.co. What's more, Travels Through Time listeners get 10% off when they enter the code TTT at the checkout. So the dream team are somewhat assembled (laughs) in Toulouse. Mm. Um, Maybe we could move on now to your final scene that you'd like to visit. Uh, once they've decided that they're going to found this intelligence network. Take us there, where are we and and what's happening? So we're now in November 1940. They've, Mathilde and Roman have uh, agreed to found the network. She has been inducted into the idea shortly before in, in October. They've been to Vichy together to the French capital, to meet the remains of the of the French Deuxième Bureau, as the MI5 equivalent was called. So they've met them, and they're now on their way to Paris. And she, um, as a French citizen going home, is allowed to cross the demarcation line between the occupied and non-occupied zone on the train. Uh, Roman has to go by a different route, which involves getting a bus, meeting a friendly person, giving him a lot of money, who then walks him across the line in some deserted spot, and then he gets on another bus, all with the false papers. Uh, She hasn't been in Paris since she was there briefly to, in fact, get a medal for her nursing work. So it's her first time back in Paris. She hasn't seen her parents in particular, her mother, who is quite an influence on her, although they're not particularly close. And she is horrified by what she finds in Paris. Uh, swastika banners hanging over the great boulevards and hanging off the Arc de Triomphe. Rationing has begun. It's a defeated city. German soldiers filling the cafes. Uh, the German Germans got a fantastic rate of exchange, which meant their rice marks went very far, so they quickly emptied the shops. She is appalled uh, at what she finds, and that, at the same time, gives her an even more energetic boost. Um, so on the day she arrives, the afternoon she arrives, she immediately finds a place, a uh, headquarters for the network. She brilliantly finds somewhere which has a converted artist studio in the roof where they can eventually run a an aerial for a, a radio. She um, squares off the landlady. I mean, doesn't tell the landlady what she's doing there. She has to pretend that she is uh, Roman's cousin to the landlady so that there are not too many moral questions asked. So on the day she arrives, 14th of November 1940, she immediately has everything prepared for Roman, who arrives that evening. They go to dinner with her mother, who they don't dare tell what they're really up to. Uh, she's appalled at this um, 
diminutive Pole who seems to be her daughter's lover, but uh, nevertheless agrees they have to live together. And the very next day, the 15th of November, is when they start writing the uh, Spies Handbook. So, and from a standing start, um, they have a couple of agents in the south uh, on the demarcation line uh, in place, but otherwise, from a standing start in November, in within a week, they've um, set up the entire organisation. They have a bit of luck. One of the things Antrallier does is is tells the Allies where the German. Uh, soldiers and Luftwaffe in particular are, so that the Allies can know where to bomb and know where the bombers... The Blitz is just starting. 14th November is a is a very big day. It's the first day of the Blitz in over London. It's also Neville Chamberlain's funeral. Uh, he, of course, being very much blamed for Britain not being armed, uh, rearmed in for the war. So from the start, they're able to start telling the Allies where the planes are taking off from where, and so on. But Roman realises, on whether they start writing the Spice Handbook, that what he doesn't have is a list of all the German insignia on their uniforms so that they can their, their spies can tell them what regiments they belong to and things. And remarkably, he goes to a second-hand bookshop where he finds a pre-war... Uh, book with all this information in um, which so he buys it under the under the noses of the the German occupiers that's going to give them away so it's it's a moment of high excitement for them and this is now they're going to begin to save the war and what resources did they have to found the network did they have resources from from the Vichy government, or were they just running off of their own, out of their own pockets? Or yeah. They were running out of their own pockets entirely. Roman had quite a expensive camera um, that he uh, he took to a pawn shop, and uh, the pawnbroker offered him a certain amount of money, and he said, what do you want the money for? And he took one of the risks that they took in those early days and said he wanted it to to help the resistance, at which point the pawnbroker doubled the money. They were pressing their friends into action. Uh, a few days later, they did come clean to Mathilde's mother, um, who agreed to sort of be a, a, a post box, as they called it, for agents to drop off reports. Uh, Mathilde went to a couple of her friends and a couple of family friends who agreed to spy. No, it was all done on a complete shoestring. And how did they communicate with London? What were they... Yeah, how were they getting messages across... To begin with, they so all these messages came into Paris three times a month. They'd leave the the sector heads would come to Paris. So there were thirteen sectors. I think they divided France into, and the sector heads would come to Paris and drop off written reports uh, in in one of three post boxes, as they were known, which Mathilde would then empty. She would take the documents back to headquarters and she and Roman would would distill them and encode them and then they had a courier whose code name was Rapide once a month Mathilde would go to the the uh, Gare d'Austerlitz in Paris and they would have distilled all these documents into no more than 16 pages of very flimsy carbon paper you would use for carbon copies because it was so thin. Uh, she would give this to Rapide, who would get on the train to Marseille. As the train took off, he would go to the first-class lavatory and unscrew the sign that said, please put down the seat after use, um, and fold, which is why there couldn't be more than 16, fold the 16 pages into a, into a flat, thing and then screw the sign back on and then he would get off the train in Dijon which was still in the occupied zone uh, the train would carry on and once it got the unoccupied zone another uh, air agent would get on unscrew the documents uh, in, and get off again at Marseille at which point the documents would go in, off to Spain which was neutral and to Lisbon and thence by air to London. So it took a very long time and indeed beca that became a real problem uh, and in the end they managed to set up 
three radios to transmit in code. Kind of, kind of thrilling though. <laughs> Quite fun. Yes. Oh, absolutely. And there was one terrible time when uh, the papers never arrived in Marseille, and they thought it's that's it. We've been discovered. Um, and they went through about a month of agony, wondering when they were going to, if the Germans would put it all together. Um, and then one time. Rappi got on the train and unscrewed the plate and found the papers from a month before and the, that carriage had been taken off for repairs and they just never never bothered oh. checking. Oh, yeah. gosh. <laughs> I know, yeah. Um, the description of Paris um, at this point, it kind of reminded me a bit of lockdown. It kind of felt that way, the curfew, um, being afraid to, um, to go out in the street for fear of being spotted or being suspected of doing something. But obviously life did continue in Paris, um, despite the occupation, despite the war, and things kept on happening. Is that fair to say? Yes, it did. I mean, people didn't have much money. And as the war went on, um, rationing became more and more acute. Coffee ran out very quickly, which, of course, would be agony to a French person. Um, and they had terrible sort of acorn coffee. Indeed, one of the ways Hugo Bleicher, when he captured Mathilde, um, persuaded her to go on side, other than threatening her with death otherwise, um, was by making her real coffee um, for breakfast, which, which was astonishing for her. All the leather... Um, certainly by the second winter of the war, 41-42, was going off to Germany to be uh, made into uniforms so people would, first of all, stuff the holes in their shoes with newspapers, then they would put wooden soles on, and everything ran down quite hard. There was no heating. Um, heating was only... Uh, there was no gas or, or oil for heating. Um, all Everything that could go to Germany for the war effort to run the factories and so on, went to Germany. So they were pretty cold and miserable. Not too bad by November 1940, but certainly by the following spring, Paris was feeling very down at heel and rationed and cold and um, it was it was pretty bleak. And how did that compare to life in the non-occupied zone? What would you say were the differences between those two parts of France? Uh, the non-occupied zone still which was so the north was the more industrialized and the south was more farmland um and although a lot of the grain and so on had to be sent to germany under the terms of the armistice non-occupied zone they had no curfews they had plenty to eat um their money still held its value and above all they didn't have the whole the curfew the german soldiers on the streets um, the constant reminders of the humiliation uh, of what it was to be occupied. And so sadly, this is our last scene, but I think we wouldn't be doing inter allied justice if we didn't sort of look forward a bit to what happens um, in the coming years uh, to the organisation and to Roman and to Mathilde. If you could just tell us a bit about that. Yes. No, uh, November 41, uh, just after the first anniversary of the of the network, and they have a discreet little glass of champagne in their headquarters to celebrate the anniversary uh, and their messages on the BBC congratulating them. But quite by chance in a bar in Brittany, a drunken docker really looking for the uh, for this German soldier to buy him a drink has been telling a story about how he was in an air raid and his this woman he was sitting next to suddenly started asking him questions about what was coming in and out of the docks. And he he was telling this as a funny story, but the uh, German thinks that's a bit odd, uh, takes it to the local Abwehr intelligence, um, who then transmit it to Paris. Normally nothing would have happened at all, but Berlin are starting to say to the Abwehr in Paris, you've caught no spies at all so so they seize on this and eventually they find out about roman and matilde in paris and arrest roman at dawn and matilde when she's going to the network the next day that is the end of antarellier they think but after a night in prison and Mathilde is offered the choice of death or or collaboration she says she'll collaborate so Bleicher 
who's completely untrained in intelligence, has the idea of setting her up as a double agent, using her radio and uh, and running it as a deception organisation, which we fall for in, in London. Uh, and this carries on for two months and put to the test, I think he, he became questionable later. I think in Mathilde's case, I think the survival instinct was very strong. I think even when she was betraying her country, she still kept some sort of belief that she would get back on the side of right. So survival and a belief that she'd done it once and she could do it again. Uh, and I think that's what kept her going. Not all of them. Some of some of the spies who were captured, and her alliés spies who were captured in those early days, uh, remained pro-German right to the end. But I think in her case, she had this remarkable spirit and courage that that was what kept her going. Yeah, she's a remarkable, flawed but complex mm. character, and it's been a real pleasure to to travel back to this moment in her life and um, to go through it with you. Just before we head back into the present, uh, what memento would you like to bring back with you from 1940? I would like to bring this handbook that Mathilde typed up and and she and Roman came up with, the, the spies' handbook, how they wanted their spies to work, because it's it's an extraordinary document that I think would be of incredible use even now um, if you were setting up a spy network. But it's the the feeling as I uh, held the original of this document and you could see her, you know, which keys on her typewriter were pushing into it and there were the little drawings of the insignia and so on, just took me right back to what it must have been, both the excitement and the danger of being in this attic in the middle of Paris and dreaming this dream of of how they were going to save the country. It was such an evocative, amazing document. Yeah, I can imagine. Whenever we ask um, guests on the podcast that question, it's something about the material object and and it really transporting you back to that moment. But everything becomes so real. Um, I always get like a bit kind of, oh, yeah, Yeah. well, (laughs) sounds amazing. Well, thank you so much, Roland, um, for joining us on Travels Through Time. It's been such an interesting conversation. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you for asking me. That was me, Artemis Irvin, speaking to Roland Phillips about his new book, Victoire, a wartime story of resistance, collaboration and betrayal. It's published by The Bodley Head and it's available to buy now. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. We'll see you next week.